call Clayton Mitchell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start my contribution today with a heavy heart by sending the Melbourne family my sincerest heartfelt condolences for the loss of a great man, Peter Melbourne, who passed away suddenly and unexpectedly this morning in Tauranga. We are thinking of him, his wife Troy, his children Chantel and Sheldon, and his brother Philip. Um, he has been a uh, pillar of our community for many, many years. He uh, was involved in Tauranga City Council for 30 years and was recently the Mount Main Street manager, and he'll be greatly missed. Mr Speaker, I stand with pride also today to speak to the Employment Standards Amendment bills and also something that I haven't done a lot of in my last 18 months of being in Parliament is actually commend a bill to the House in full support. And it was a fantastic feeling going through the committee of the whole House on Tuesday and seeing the solidarity right around the House. Um, and I just have to say that that was certainly something very, very good. Uh, we would like to certainly see more of that. I do think, however, we've got a failure to communicate. And what we saw on last week when I, to my shock and many others' surprise, we heard Labor come out and support um, the bill, despite there being no amendments made in the committee stage not being brought through. It sort of made me stop in my tracks. Because we did, as Mr Ian Lees Galloway say, um, together write up the minority report showing the solidarity of opposition. And the comment that comes to mind is, we cannot support what amounts to a broken promise of working New Zealanders. And this government, let's be honest, has had many broken promises over the year. In fact, I bought a folder full of broken promises. So it was a big shock to New Zealand first and to myself, sir, when we thought, oh no, what's going on here? But it was that failure to communicate, an obligation that we saw this government to approach New Zealand first and all opposition partners, parties, to actually involve them in discussions and conversations. I leave this uh, at this point to, to say that just purely, sir, that we are happy with the outcome, but I think it needs to be brought to the attention of the House that if you are talking about an open, transparent government that's working for the best outcomes of all, then you really need to have that bipartisan approach with all members of Parliament. And it does make me also talk about the select committee process where we saw the lines being drawn and the fight being given to try and get this resolved when it came to zero-hour contracts, and yet it was at times like butting our head up against the wall because the members of the government were not wanting to rock the boat. We were wanting to keep it straight and steady, sir, and that I would like to see change in the future, that we can actually have open, genuine dialogue where you can have an opinion to it and you can actually challenge your own party's position to put something forward that's actually going to be for the betterment of New Zealanders. And this is an example of exactly that, where we had to go out of select committee to actually correct something. That was inherently wrong, sir. I was also a little bit embarrassed as a politician on Tuesday night when I saw on the news members of parties that were squawking and fluffing their feathers up, trying to take what they saw as their role in fixing this problem up. And it is no wonder, sir, that New Zealanders sometimes hold politicians in such low regard when we saw this sort of sanctimonious pomp and self-imposed importance, where we saw members of parties thinking that they were eagles flying above our heads when they actually need to realise they need to come back down to earth, get real and realise they're turkeys like everybody else. We've got a job to do. We are public servants and we are there to come out with the best possible outcomes for New Zealand and New Zealanders. That, is said, that aside, sir, this bill is a fantastic bill. There is probably one main area that I will spend some time to talk on that I see there is a flaw um, that will need to be fixed and I believe with support from around the parties uh, in this House we will resolve that and that's around casual employment contracts, sir. This bill, though, does address the imbalance that we have had in this country for many years where employees are held back by some employers, not all. I know a majority um, of businesses operate and have always continued to operate in a professional um, manner with their employees and created them and, the, and their workers as equals. This bill brings back the balance in that relationship. 
You can't have any relationship, whether it be a sporting one, a, 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 a personal relationship or other, otherwise, if there is a, a power struggle between uh, one person with more than, than the other. This bill addresses that and brings that balance into line. Mr Speaker, casual employment uh, agreements do have a place in a modern workplace and Mr, uh, the Minister himself did actually come out um, at the Committee of the Whole House stage and make that very, very clear, that a casual employment agreement, if dealt with correctly, um, is going to be, make up a large part of empl uh, employment agreements around the country, sir. But we heard from submitters, many thousands of submitters, 12,260 in total that took the time out of their day to, to submit, and uh, hundreds of them that came in specifically to talk to us. And I can only talk about one particular, and this was a professional lawyer, because when we talk about vulnerable workers, we think of uneducated people, sir, but here we had a, 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 an educated lawyer who was a, um, a mother who was struggling under a casual employment agreement to get enough hours and enough uh, certainty in her workplace to actually give her a quality of life that we would be, expect somebody of that um, education to be able to handle. And then on converse, conversely to that, I had, I had conversations with other people in similar situations, another lawyer in fact, who was on a casual employment agreement that suited her to be virtually on call as and when required. The difference being is there was a need for work by one person who was a uh, young mother, the other was a retired, semi-retired person who was a lawyer who really just did it as and when she felt. So the balance was naturally there. But when the balance isn't naturally there, you do find people on casual and employment agreements can find themselves in a vulnerable situation where they are begging almost for the scraps of time from their employer to get work done. And there's no incentive for the employer to actually get this person onto fixed, whether it be part-time or full-time or a contract basis, employment. There's no incentive whatsoever. What we propose, New Zealand First strongly supposes, and, and we get proposed and is supported by the Greens and Labor, and we'd like to see some support across, is to get a casual loading system for casual employment agreements. Now, it works very, very well in Australia, and the proposal is a 19% loading on a casual employment agreement to incentivise the employer, because it's costing them more, to get that employee off um, the casual and onto fixed or part-time or full-time hours, sir. How that worked, that 19% was broken down, was 1.6% for bereavement leave and, uh, and um, sickness leave. Now, of course, in a normal agreement, you're not entitled to those uh, until you've been working for six months, so that would be a loading. Then you've got 4.4% of statutory holidays, which part-time and full-time uh, workers, employees, have the benefit of. So that would be considered a loading, so that's a total of 6%. Then we added 5% for, for, the, um, for the employee to say that you're, you're casual, we wanted to give you a bonus for that, that comes to 11. And then, of course, the 8% that is an entitlement to all workers. So we're talking about, in actual fact, 11%. And when I asked the Minister the question, what is this government proposing to do for casual employees, he obfuscated and passed the buck to Jonathan Young, the chair of our committee, for him to stand up and give me a, an address on that and an answer. And I was a little bit shocked, sir, because all I got was the supplementary order paper read back to us verbatim and said that we can't support this because there's no incentive for the, employee, uh, for the employer to, um, to, to take them off that because you're only talking a small amount of, uh, of, a, of a boost and uh, that wouldn't be enough to take people off that. I was shocked. I said, well, why didn't you make it 25%? I did scream that across the house, sir, so it might not be picked up in the hansard. But the reality is we need to address that and I hope we get um, some cross-party support as we go uh, further through this year. Paid parental leave, sir, was a fantastic um, 16 to 18 weeks. We'd like to see that further increased out to 26 weeks. Uh, there is much better enforcement in this new legislation, sir. The inability for employers to take um, deductions out of wages has been removed. It is a much clearer, much more uh, open and transparent um, employment agreement, sir, and we do commend this to the House. Thank you, sir.